Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. Have you ever had a conversation with a non-believer or maybe someone who's more critical or cynical of the faith, and they say something along the lines of, well, I would believe in God if you could provide me evidence. Uh, I, I don't believe they would say in unicorns or the Loch Ness Monster or Santa Claus because, well, it's the same reason I don't believe in God. There is no proof that they exist. But if you would provide me proof that they exist, then I would believe in God. And the implication of that kind of reasoning and that kind of argument is that God is a physical being inside a physical world. Then that we should be able to scientifically evaluate God just like anything else. Um, up until 2010, my wife and I, we lived in Maui, in Hawaii, for about eight years, suffering for Jesus. Like, it was really hard. And <laughs> I was pastoring a church there. And in 2010, we left Maui to another island, uh, to England, where I was born, and um, had a chance to do my master's degree at the university there in Oxford. And when I was there, it was such a fascinating time. It was, um, yeah, an incredible time of learning and meeting some fascinating people. But I got invited to go to this panel. It was a small group of maybe 50 people or so. And we're having this discussion about the existence of God. And what they had done is they had invited people in uh, from different perspectives on faith um, to dialogue and discuss. And one of the people in attendance was Richard Dawkins. Now Richard Dawkins lived right near the place where I studied about a stone's throw away. I didn't throw stones, but he, 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 he lived there. Now, if you've never heard of him, he's the world's most famous atheist. And uh, he wrote a book a number of years ago called The God Delusion, New York Times bestseller. So really against God, not just an atheist, but kind of an anti-theist. And during this time, they open it up for Q&A. And they're like, okay, did anyone have questions? And someone asked a question and they said, Professor Dawkins, um, if God were to reveal himself to you, if he were to show up physically, or if God were to write in the clouds in Hebrew, I exist. <laughs> if God were to do something like that, would you believe in him? And his answer was really fascinating. And I think telling, uh, he said, no. And they pressed him like, okay, wh wh why not? Why wouldn't you? And he said, well, if, if God were to do something like that, then, then what I would want to do, he said as a scientist, is I would want to bring God into the lab. <laughs> I'd want to examine him under a microscope. I'd, I'd want to dissect him and, and try and understand more. Because obviously if he did that, then he is just some physical being within the physical world. Now, intriguing answer on so many levels. And I think that's where many people are at who claim that they don't believe in God because they think, well, we should be able to prove God just like anything else. Now, here's the problem with that, is that as Christians, and, and really any theist, doesn't see God that way. As Christians, we don't believe that God is simply a physical being confined into a physical world. Instead, the way we would define God, by definition, we'd say God is without limits, right? He, he's the cause of all things. He's the source of all things. He is both within the universe, but he's also outside of the universe. Um, one of the most important verses on this, and if you're taking notes, you can jot it down, Colossians chapter one. Paul writes, for in him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So we believe that everything that exists depends upon God to exist. The breath in our lungs, the heart that's beating inside our chest, each moment is a gift from God. And that is why for hundreds of years, the way that philosophers and theologians have argued for the existence of God is rather than looking for empirical arguments, instead what they do is look to logical arguments. That is, rather than looking for God inside of the physical world, okay, 
Let's build a bigger telescope or a stronger microscope. Then maybe we'll find God. Instead, what, what theologians have done is they ask the question, this is huge, does the evidence or does the existence of God make sense of the world as we see it? Does the existence of God make sense of the world as we see it? So in 1961, in the USSR, they sent their first man to space. And he comes back down and they held this press conference and everyone's real excited to hear about this new Soviet space program, but they also used it as an opportunity to promote atheism. In fact, one of the guys who was there, Nikita Khrushchev, um, he made this fascinating statement. He's one of the leaders in the Communist Party and they're talking about this new space exploration program. But then Nikita, he said, they went to space and there is no God there. Fascinating. Now, C.S. Lewis, who was alive during that time and writing during that time, he responded by, by writing an article. And you can actually go online, look it up. It's called The Seeing Eye. And in this article, writing for a British newspaper, he said, look, if there's a God who created us, you're not gonna find this God by going up into space. He said, that would kind of be the equivalent of a man who lives on the first story of a house and he wants to meet the man who lives on the second. Well, all he has to do is climb some stairs because it's just a matter of spatial difference. But he said that, that that's not the way we understand God. That's not the way that, that God works. He says a, a better analogy would be how would Hamlet know that Shakespeare existed? How would he know anything about Shakespeare? And Lewis wrote, he said, well, the only way that Hamlet would know something about Shakespeare would be if Shakespeare wrote something into the play about himself. <laughs> if Shakespeare was feeding information, Hamlet would not know about Shakespeare by saying, well, I've got to find him. I don't know if, if Shakespeare exists. I know, I'll go look in the rafters of the playhouse. Lewis said, well, he can, he can search all he wants. He's not gonna find him that way. The only way he will know about Shakespeare is if Shakespeare writes something into the story. And the point that Lewis is making is that when it comes to our understanding of God, the way we're gonna find him is not, okay, let's build a bigger telescope. Is God out there? Rather, we need to ask the question, how has God revealed himself? Or what are, what are some signposts? What are some clues pointing us to the, the existence of God? Or how has God written himself into the story? How has he written himself into your story? So that's what I wanna unpack with you this afternoon until about 5.30. So I wanna look at four things if you're taking notes. The first one is this, how do I know God exists? Well, let's begin with existence itself. Number one, the universe exists. The universe exists. Now, this is also known as the cosmological argument. If you have a background in philosophy, this will ring a bell. The cosmological argument is basically, it goes like this, number one, Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe had a beginning. Number three, therefore the universe had a cause. And number four, that cause is God. Or if you're really into philosophy, to quote Martin Heidegger, why is there something rather than nothing at all? When you look at the universe, whether it's the drama and chaos of deep space, or the mysteries of quantum mechanics, or the moment of the Big Bang, all of these things are clues. They're, they're signposts pointing to an ultimate cause. Something created it, something caused it, something is responsible. And this is true, not just on a grand cosmological scale, this is true just in daily life. Things have, things have a cause, things have a purpose. Um, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was a Monday. And on Mondays, typically, I have a lot of meetings here at the church. And all of a sudden, we, we notice that our lights all throughout the building were like flickering and just doing weird things. It was like Blair Witch West Side. It was really kind of, we're like, what is going on? And our internet wasn't working and just stuff was kind of breaking. Like, what is, what's happening? So we call an electrician and the electrician, he, he starts hunting around trying to find the source of the problem. And he comes back, I don't know, half hour, hour later or something. He says, well, I found it. And it turns out that a squirrel had gotten behind the walls and have found one of the, the main electrical wires 
and had gnawed through it, effectively cutting off our electricity, and it was the end of a squirrel. So, after a moment's silence, I then asked, <laughs> I, I then, I then asked the electrician, like, why would he do that? That's really odd. Like, why, why? And he said, well, believe it or not, he said, I've seen this many times before, <laughs> believe it or not, squirrels, they actually like to gnaw through electrical things because it gives them a buzz. <laughs> and I'm like, I know a few people like that, right? So whether you're talking about a squirrel or quantum mechanics, things have a cause, things have a reason for their being. That's all that the cosmological argument is. Now, I know that some people would respond to this and I've had conversations along these lines. I say, sure, yeah, of course, things have a cause. I mean, very few people are gonna argue with that. But I've had conversations where they say, well, that cause doesn't have to be God, right? Uh, maybe you've seen some recent books along these lines. Lawrence Krauss, a physicist from ASU, he wrote a book not too long ago called A Universe from Nothing. Um, and he, he would define nothing as, as gravity. Um, um, uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, he wrote a book a few years ago called The Grand Design. And the argument of both of these books is essentially the same. What they say is, because of quantum gravity, the universe, they say, doesn't have a beginning. And thus, if we can get rid of the idea of a beginning, we don't really need there to be a God. How do we respond to that? Well, earlier I mentioned uh, John Lennox. John Lennox, he's an Oxford mathematician, brilliant guy. I actually got to know him when I was there and just in love with Jesus as well as being super sharp. And he and Hawking have this fascinating relationship where it just seems that they kind of debate on a lot of things and shadow boxing in their writings and stuff. And so Hawking writes the grand, uh, the grand design saying, okay, we don't need there to be God because of gravity. Lennox responds to his book with his own book. And the name of the book he wrote was God and Stephen Hawking. And, <laughs> and it's really intriguing. You can pick it up. It's actually a pretty quick read. And he says, Hawking is wrong on three different levels. He says, first of all, the law of gravity is something. It's not nothing, right? So where did that law come from? Secondly, he says it's logically incoherent to say that X created X. It's like saying, where did this cup of water come from? Well, the cup of water created it. Circular, right? Doesn't make sense. But thirdly, he said, laws by definition depend on the existence of nature. That is, laws describe reality, but they don't create reality. So what, what's Hawking gonna say? Well, Hawking then was interviewed by a British newspaper. I think it may have been The Guardian. And they asked him, okay, what, what do you think? What do you think about God and all that? And Hawking responded, and he said, quote, religion is a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the dark. They then naturally go to Lennox, who's in Oxford, and they're like, hey, uh, Hawking just said religion's a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the dark. What, what do you have to say? And without a moment, just, just blinking, he responded and said, well, atheism is a fairy tale for those afraid of the light. <laughs> and and I, love, I love that because the point he's making here, and I, and I think it's a good one, is that you know what? Both sides are a leap of faith. It's true. As followers of Jesus, believers in God, sure, it's a, it's a leap of faith. Absolutely. I think there's good reasons for that faith. We're talking about that today. But it is a leap of faith. But to believe that all of it came into being without an ultimate cause. To think that all of it came into being with, without something, someone, well, that is even a greater leap of faith, which brings me to the second point. Well, how do I know God exists? Well, first of all, look around, right? The universe exists, but secondly, the world is uniquely designed for life. The world is uniquely designed for life. This is also known as the teleological argument, for those of you with a background in philosophy. Uh, it comes from the root word telos, and telos means purpose or design. It's a simple argument. Basically, it says, the universe is highly complex. No one's gonna argue with that. <laughs> Therefore, it must have a designer. It's one of the most 
oldest and I think strongest arguments out there. In fact, David, who wrote 3,000 years ago in the book of Psalms, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, and the skies proclaim the work of his hand. If you want proof that God exists, David, he says, look, Look at how God made it. Not just that he made it, but look how he made it. The more we study the universe, whether it's through the microscope or through the telescope, the more profound and interwoven and multi-layered and complex it appears to be, where each new discovery isn't pointing us away from a designer, but towards a designer. In fact, some people would argue, and I find this so compelling, Some would say the universe couldn't exist if it wasn't designed. Now this is also known as the science of fine tuning or the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle, what's that? Well, essentially what it says is everything in the universe, molecules, matter, carbon, oxygen, the distance from the sun, everything is exactly what it needs to be to sustain life. And and if those constants were off by just a fraction, by just a hair, life wouldn't be possible. How so? How, How do we live in a finely tuned universe? Well, check out a few examples here. Now, there are at least 122, and that number is growing all the time. The more we learn about this, the more mind-boggling it becomes. You look at the sun, 93 million miles away. If it was 92 million miles away, if we were 94 million miles away, life could not exist. We're exactly the Goldilocks zone, uh, Ralph Davies, or Davies put it, that we're exactly in that, in that space where life can exist. If we're any closer, any further, wouldn't be possible. The tilt of the earth, 23.5 degrees. If that was off sli- slightly, half of the earth would become tidally locked. Half of the earth would get nothing but sun, lucky them, and the other half would, would perish. Hydrogen, 0.007%. It must convert that of its mass to helium continually for the earth to sustain life. Atmosphere, 21% oxygen, has to be 21%. 22 wouldn't work, 20 wouldn't work. The ocean, 3.4% salt is in the ocean, which by the way, it's intriguing. That's the exact amount of salt that's in our bloodstream, 3.4%. If that were off slightly, life could not exist. The expansion rate of the universe, this is so intriguing and mind-blowing to me. The universe is expanding. It's growing into what? Who knows? But it's expanding, right? The edges of the universe constantly going further and further out. The rate of expansion has to be exactly what it is, otherwise life would not be possible. In fact, let's just take that last point as an example. Um, If it was any faster or slower, we wouldn't be here. And physicists say that the odds of it being just the way that it is, is one in 10 to the 55. Now, my eyes glaze over when I hear that number. Okay, what what does that even mean? To put that into perspective, I have some dice here, and um, or a dice. The chances of me rolling a six is one in six. So let's see what happens. It w- seriously, it's a six. This is <laughs> now you're like big deal. Okay, this is the third. This is the third teaching in a row. It was a six. Unbelievable. So, um, the chances of that happening is one in six. Um, the chances of me rolling six again, what is that? It's exponential. It's one in thirty-six. So let's see. Two, that's it. Now, last gathering, it was a six again, which is amazing. Now, if I keep rolling this dice, what are the chances of me getting 70 sixes in a row? It's the same, it's the same principle. It's one in 10 to the 55th power. What does that mean? How long would I have to stand here rolling the dice to get 70 sixes in a row? Well, the answer is 100 <laughs> trillion trillion, 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 trillion years. That's a long time, right? That is 
that is the same, the same chance of just that last point of the expansion rate of the universe being the way it is. And that's just one of the constants. And there are over 122. Now, if you want to go further in this, there's a podcast I recommend. It is so good. It's called Unbelievable. And it's by a guy named Justin Brierley, who lives in England. And uh, every week, he brings someone new onto the show. And I share that with you because that example I just used came from Justin Brierley. And it's a fantastic show. He'll bring on atheists, a Christian, to dialogue to debate. It's really, really good and thought-provoking. But what we're learning is that because of these discoveries, more and more scientists, as we see the anthropic principle and we're learning about the universe, are like, uh, how can we actually say that this is all accidental? Uh, this is actually, the dice must be loaded somewhere. How is this even possible? And so you'll get interesting responses like multiverse. What's multiverse? Come back this afternoon or tomorrow night and there will be a discussion on multiverse. People come up with these ideas of how do we explain that because it is so unlikely. And what we're seeing, this is so cool, is that many scientists are actually coming to faith because they're seeing these things unfold and they don't know how else to describe it other than, okay, there has to be some kind of cause. So Arno Penzias, co-discoverer of the radiation afterglow, Ed Harrison, a cosmologist, Francis Collins, you guys heard of him? Uh, he wrote the book called The Language of God. Uh, he is the founder of the, the, the Human Genome Project, brilliant guy. And this was one of the things that really won him over. Another guy, Anthony Flew, Anthony Flew, He's a fascinating thinker. Anthony Flew, if you have a philosophy background, you'll recognize his name. He was the Richard Dawkins of last generation. Um, super sharp, did not believe in God. He wrote all these books arguing against the existence of God. Very, very popular guy. His writings, his books, he'd speak all around the world. Anthony Flew, I think it was 2004, 2005, he came out and said, I have changed my mind. Uh, I actually believe now that a God exists. And he, he wrote this book, uh, <laughs> There Is a God. And you see the word no is crossed out. How the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. I can summarize that whole book for you here. What changed his mind was the science of fine tuning. The more that he saw how finely tuned our world is, the anthropic principle, the Goldilocks zone, the more he saw that, the more he became convinced this cannot be the result of just blind, pitiless indifference. There has to be something more that's going on here. And by the way, that's what makes science so exciting and exhilarating. And that is why I'm, I'm really passionate about this point. I think Christians should be leading the charge when it comes to the discoveries of science. Because everything about creation is an opportunity to see the fingerprints of God. Biology, chemistry, physiology, neurology, psychology, astronomy. If God is the ocean, then science is the vessel that explores the depths of his creativity and his beauty. And so that is why as followers of Jesus, we celebrate it. Wow, another discovery, God, you are so creative. This isn't God of the gap stuff. This is God of the whole show stuff. This is a God who is so ingenious to make the world this way. Well, how do I know he exists? The universe exists. How do I know he exists? Because the world is uniquely designed for life. This brings me to our third point, and I won't spend too long here, but let me say, if you're looking to get a PhD, I think a ton of work needs to be done on this issue when it comes to understanding the existence of God. I think it's an exciting area of research. Dostoevsky once said, that beauty will change the world or save the world. And what he meant by that is when we look at the world, we don't just see design and order. Sure, that's there. I mean, look at the cell, incredibly complex. But we also see beauty. What does beauty do? Beauty awakens a longing within us. The, the, the Catholic theologian Thomas Dubé, Thomas Dubé, he said, the experience of beauty evokes a nameless yearning for something more than the earth can offer. It reawakens our spirit's aching need for the infinite, a hunger for more than matter can provide. Beauty is like a signpost. Doing what? Pointing us to the source of beauty. It makes us ask the question, where does beauty come from? 
when we witness the colors of a sunset on Cannon Beach, when you see light dancing on the leaves of the trees, when you, when you hear a song that, that moves you, when you see the reflection of Mount Hood on Trillium Lake, when you stand before a work of art, when you fall in love, when you hear a child's cry, right? When you watch, when you watch BBC's Planet Earth 2, have you guys seen that, by the way? Have, have you, has anyone seen BBC's Planet Earth 2? Okay, you all need to repent and then go home and watch it. It is seriously the best show. It is unbelievable. So uh, David Attenborough, who's, who's a hero of mine, they, they made this new documentary just showing animals and the, they have these penguins riding 50 foot waves. Like after watching that, my spirit animal is a penguin. It, it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, there's, these, there's these Galapagos marine iguanas running from racer snakes. That scene alone will just move you to tears. It is so epic. That's a total tangent and really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the point. But it does make this point is that you look at the beauty of our world and you just see how creative our God is. And you have to ask the question, are these accidental? Is this just a product of chaos and time and chance? Or is there a God behind it? And if they are accidental, then why are they so beautiful? And why do we long for more of that beauty? And I would suggest the reason why is because we were created by a beautiful God who in Genesis, he created a beautiful world and he put eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes says, a longing for beautiful things. And the Bible ends, it says that God's dream for the world is beauty. Check out Revelation 22. God someday will wipe away every tear from our eyes. All things will pass away. All things will be made new. So how do I know he exists? The universe exists. The world is, is finely tuned for life. The world is beautiful. And number four, and finally, Morality exists. Now track with me on this one because I think this is one of the most vital points of all. Romans 2.15, Paul writes, the, the law is written on our heart. He says, our conscience is evidence of the reality of God. Our conscience is evidence of the reality of God. What does he mean by that? Simply this. If there was no God, there would be no objective reason for morality. If there was no God, there'd be no objective reason for morality. But when you look at the world, everyone has moral intuitions. It doesn't matter if you, you live in the suburbs of Portland, the plains of Africa, in the jungles of the South Pacific, we all have a deep sense of what's right and wrong. Even children, children get this from the earliest age. They, they, they know what's right and wrong. They know what a lie is. You don't have to sit down with four-year-old Johnny and say, okay, honey, I wanna teach you how to deceive people. I wanna teach you how to lie. It's called American politics. No, you don't, you don't have to do that, right? Instead, it's like they know somehow, <laughs> they figured it out. We all have that conscience within us. Question, where does that come from? Where does morality come from? Now, I've read books on this, had conversations with people on this. Some, would, some response is, well, it comes from evolution. It's just a byproduct of natural selection. Okay, I find that, that whole conversation so intriguing, fascinating. But when you look at evolution, you look at natural selection, it's, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal, right? Nature is red and tooth and claw, and natural selection, it's the strong that survive, right? Survival of the fittest. If we base our morality on that, society as we know it would collapse. We'd have some serious issues if, if we say, yep, evolution, that's our guide for morality. There has to be something more. Others would say, well, we, we get our morality from society, collectively, together. We determine what's right and wrong. But that still doesn't answer the question, where do we get that collective sense? Now, this is, this is intriguing to me. This, just take the idea of moral progress. I think most Portlanders, believers in God and non-believers, would say, hey, I believe in, in progress. We hear that word a lot. We're moving forward. We're becoming more open as a society or whatever. So take, take slavery, for example. Um, up until 1865, our country believed that 
slavery was, was legal. At least many in our country did, right? 1865, the laws changed. We look back at 1865, 150 years later, and we're repulsed by the idea of slavery. We're, we're ashamed that that's a part of our story. People, most people would say, hey, we've progressed <laughs> as a culture, right? We've moved forward as a culture. We have become, and this is both Christians, non-Christians who would say this, we have become more moral because we no longer have slavery in our country. Okay, true. But if you don't believe in God, this raises a ton of questions, okay? You believe in moral progress. You believe we're becoming more tolerant or open or whatever as a culture, great. What is moving us forward? And why, objectively, if you don't believe in God, why is the culture of 2017 objectively better than the culture of 1865? And if culture is our definition of morality, then what culture? Why not Saudi Arabia culture? Why not ISIS culture? Why not, well, I went to a country a few years ago where cannibalism was totally accepted and totally normal. Now, if I don't believe in God, do I have an objective reason to say to them, you should not eat me? <laughs> I have very strong preferences, right? But can I objectively say, what can I do in that situation? How could I objectively critique it aside from giving them the cold shoulder? which is a horrible cannibal joke. Just forget I said that. Horrible cannibal joke, right? <laughs> so, so horrible. So if there is no God, if there is no God, where do we get that moral intuition from? If there is no God, then in what way can we say we're making moral, quote, progress? William Lane Craig, I mentioned his book earlier. He said, in a world without God, who's to say whose values are right and whose are wrong? There can be no objective right and wrong, only our culturally and personally relative subjective judgments. Think of what that means. It means it's impossible to condemn war, oppression, or crime as evil. Nor can you praise generosity, self-sacrifice, and love as good. For in a universe without God, good and evil do not exist. There is only the bare, valueless fact of existence, and there is no one to say, you are right, and I am wrong. Fascinating. Now, if there is no God, absolutely. Th th this universe has no moral compass to it. Richard Dawkins, if you want an atheist perspective on what he just said, the atheist version of what he just said, read uh, his uh, River Out of Eden. And in River Out of Eden, he says, hey, the universe is just, it's cold, it's empty, there's no evil, there's no good, it's blind, it's pitiless, it's indifferent to our suffering. And so for many atheists, they would agree with that point that we cannot objectively say that morality exists. In fact, another one, kind of in the spirit of Nietzsche, is a guy named John Gray. And I kind of, <laughs> I'm semi-reluctant to mention John Gray because um, he wrote a book called Straw Dogs. And I don't recommend it, but I also do recommend it if you want to be disturbed. And <laughs> in Straw Dogs, John Gray, this hardcore atheist, he takes some of the new atheists to task. So he's an atheist critiquing atheism, critiquing his own fellow atheists, guys like Sam Harris or Daniel Dennett and others. And he says, look, the problem with these guys, and he's a philosopher from London, he says the problem with these guys is they don't go far enough. They say that they don't believe in God, but they still wanna have morality. And in Straw Dogs, John Gray says, no, we need to throw out the whole package. If we don't believe in God, we as atheists cannot say we believe in objective morality. And he makes this argument, again, if you want to be totally freaked out, read the book. But he says, hey, we cannot objectively say that certain things are wrong. We cannot say, and he actually says that the Holocaust is wrong because if there is no God, it's all an illusion anyway. He says an atheistic view of the universe cannot offer a moral framework. Now, the reason why it's so disturbing, <laughs> the reason why it's so chilling is if you really believe that, if you really believe he's telling the truth, if you really believe that there is no objective right or wrong, that will shape how you live your life. <laughs> Ideas matter. What, what you think about the world, what you think about God, 
it actually matters. It will influence how you live, how you treat others, your values, your morality, your view of human rights, your politics. If you don't believe God exists, those things inevitably will reflect that belief. And I know that it's uber sexy right now for some people to say, look, I grew up in a Christian home and I read half of the God delusion, so I'm an atheist, right? And they tell their family or roommates or friends or whatever, and people are like, oh, I can't believe it. But he's kind of feeling cool and edgy because he's an atheist now. He hasn't thought it through. He hasn't thought it through. If you're gonna go down that path, you actually need to see where that path leads. And Nietzsche, he said, if you stare into the abyss long enough, and he's talking about nihilism, if you stare into the abyss long enough, it will stare back into you. Ideas matter. Ideas have consequences. Ideas shape the trajectory of your life. So you have that worldview with its implications. But if you believe in a God who made us in his image, if you believe, as Psalm 139 says, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, if you believe that there is such a thing as purpose, if you believe in ultimate justice, and we didn't even touch on that today, if you believe in objective morality, that will shape your life too. And that is why this question lies at the core of all other questions. That is why this question is essential for us to wrestle with and grapple with. How do I know he's there? Because the universe exists, because the world is finally designed for life, because the world is beautiful, because morality exists as well. And if we have time, and we don't, but if we did, we could touch on things like the ontological argument, the what? Come tomorrow night, you'll hear about that. We could talk about consciousness. Oh my goodness, there's so many exciting discoveries with this right now. Mathematics, guys like John Lennox, other mathematicians discovering all of these mathematical signposts pointing to a God. The historicity of Jesus, the Bible. Next week is gonna be so vital because we're talking about the Bible. We could talk about personal experience, but let, let me close with this. Even if someone says, I don't believe in God, they still worship something. They still worship something. Everyone worships. And if you don't believe in a God who created you in his image, what's gonna happen is that inevitably you will begin to make a God in your own image. And I think that is so much the ethos of Portland. That is so much where we're at culturally right now. I'll just designer God, just make up my own God and he'll look a whole lot like me. Oh wow, so you're worshiping yourself. That's a God too, right? So everyone worships and what you worship makes all the difference. David Foster Wallace, a postmodern novelist, he said this, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. <laughs> And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. <laughs> Worship power, and you'll end up feeling weak and afraid, and you'll need even more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out also known as being a freshman in college, right? <laughs> so the question isn't what we worship. The question is, is who we worship? Who do you worship? Jesus, the woman said, I'm thirsty. And Jesus answered her in John 4, and he said, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I offer, you will never thirst Again, she was thirsty because everyone is thirsty. It doesn't matter what your story is, your background, what culture, what country, what you think about God. 
Everyone's thirsty, everyone's seeking, everyone's yearning, everyone has an angst for more, and we're trying different things, and we're going to different wells, and we're trying to find satisfaction in relationships, or sex, or money, or power, or jobs, or career, whatever, and we find the more we drink of those wells that they leave us more empty than before. We find ourselves coming up for air, desperate for something that will satisfy our humanity. All other gods dehumanize us with the exception of the true God who made us in his image, in his likeness, and he says, come and follow me. You drink of this water, you will thirst. But if you drink of the water I give, you will never thirst again. Okay, where is this water? She didn't have a clue what he's talking about. <laughs> where is that sounds great. I'd, I'd like some, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. And Jesus answered her, he said, I who am speaking to you am he. I am, I am. Moses, who are you, Lord? Who, sh who shall I say sent me? And God said, I am, I am. It's God and you come to the well that is God and he will satisfy you and free you and heal you and renew you and give you a purpose other than the purposes we invent for ourselves. He'll give you hope that this world apart from God cannot offer. You come to this God and he rescues you and he saves you. And that is why most of us are here today because I think the strongest proof for the existence of God is you. <laughs> It's your life and it's your story because you were blind, but now you see. You were lost, but now you're found. He rescued you, he changed you, and that is why we worship him. Amen? Amen. So let's go. We get to go from this place. <laughs> and we get to tell our city, we get to tell our city and show our city, more importantly, that this God is here.